Hi there, I'm Clifford Bates, and welcome uh, to Basic Political Science Methods. Um, again, this is, uh, we're looking at Van Avers, Stephen Van Avers, uh Guide to Methods of, for Political Science, and talk about basic methods about doing research. Today's topic is about dissertations or theses. Or re now, I mean, He's writing it as a dissertation, a book basically written for doctoral dissertation, but this could apply to master thesis or even a research paper, okay? This is the type of re uh, 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 about what constitutes a research project in that sense, what kind of what kind of themes that, that drive it, and uh, some writing issues. I might address the writing issues a little bit today, although I didn't want to go much into it. So let's go, let's go zoom it down and move over here and... Uh, begin our analysis of this, right? So, what is this? What is a political science dissertation? Now, dissertation in political science uh, uh, can perform several principal missions. Okay? Therefore, the, what are the missions we do this style? Th this gives rise to seven types of dissertations, one for each mission. The most dissertation performs several of these. Now, so most dissertations kind of are hybrids. They perform several of these uh, 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 missions and are hybrids, right? But it is still useful to consider possible ideal types of dissertation. So now he's going to talk about these seven ideal types. But most dissertations are kind of little bit of, uh, uh, of one or more, or maybe even two or three types of dissertations. Now he goes, here he goes, um, uh, footnote one, he goes, and my example suggests what follows was drafted for students in submission of international relations and security fields. It could apply to other uh, 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 political science fields. However, the exception of political philosophy. In other words, uh, 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 now I disagree with him. I, I, this is where I think he's wrong. I think there is this kind of idea that, not, I mean, I think this is the problem of political science, political philosophy. Political philosophy and like this actually has similar things is, is, is that we would, would would approach it differently and more historical in a sense. Um, and I, I think they're similar to the points he's doing. But this is mostly written for traditional political scientists and not for political theorists. So I can understand he's saying that well, this is not really suitable to political theorists in that sense. People say, well, political theory, you know, and this is the problem with political theory types. Political theory types tend to kind of like have automatic hostility towards methodology. We look at methodology and say, oh, God, that's his quantification and things like that. And I think that is a there is there is some legitimacy to this because, you know, honestly, I mean, uh, my experience as a graduate student was that the teacher of methodology was mediocre. And um, honestly, um, this and I was. And also pushed, always argued that methods was statistics, okay? Which I think, this is why Ben Evers is a very, I think this is why I prefer Ben Evers book because it didn't, it didn't, it kind of argued that no, no, no. Uh, yes, the dogma of methodology is that it does that, but he's saying that, uh, no, let's, let's understand the, I mean, what he does, he's not denying that you need to do quantitative methods and, 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 and uh, 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 statistics in that sense, but but that statistics is not always going to work. Regression, uh, 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 a statistical modeling is not always necessary. It depends on the kind of data you're using and how you're trying to do it. And and I think this is what, and therefore you also it assumes an understanding of the basics that most people don't really have. And what Van Everett did in his earlier work here was give the basics. Well, you, you you should have maybe addressed this a little earlier, but I think we're wrapping up it, so I was going to do that. So therefore, this is again the basics of this, and this I think this is what's so good about this book, and that th therefore he gives the basics in that sense. Uh, but now let's go look at his analysis of what's going on here, the basics of what he's doing here, and and I think this is the thing, is that uh, I mean let's talk about a little second a minute more about the uh, his point about. This is not really applying to political theory. And many of this bias is his understanding of IR and security studies. Um, I think everything he says here is also applied to American government, comparative government. And as for theory, I think the difference is that we tend to be more, yes, our understanding is, uh, the question is, you, you, we, we, what is a theory, okay? He has a, he has a much more, this idea of a claim 
It's more his idea of theory is the kind of argument logic, the claim of a thing, the working, the inner workings. Whereas political theorists think of that more as a systemic structure of a series. But again, they, they, they echo the same meaning. It's that often what we are not, we are looking more directly at necessary, some of the ideas or the meta ideas or the things behind the, the claims, okay? And where the, the, the main political scientist looks at the claims or the workings or the doings of the idea in that sense, or the, uh, uh, or the theory in that sense. So this is what he, he, we talk about here. Now, um, let's go look at the sev uh, uh, seven types. One, theory proposing dissertation advances a new hypothesis. A deductive argument uh, uh, for these uh, hypotheses is advanced. So a deductive argument for these are advanced. Examples may be offered here to illustrate the hypothesis and to demonstrate their plausibility. But strong empirical tests are not performed. Now, examples of theory proposals include works of Jarvis's like uh, uh, Perceptions and Misperceptions and in International Politics, Jarvis's, uh, Robert Jarvis's uh, article Cooperation Under Security Duress, Waltz's Theories of International Politics, uh, uh, Jeffrey Blaney's uh, 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 Causes of War, uh, Thomas Schelling Arms and Influence, Thomas Schelling's Strategy of Conflict, Robert Axelrod's Evolution of Cooperation, Clausewitz's Art of War, uh, he goes on, right? And he goes, Morgenthau's Politics Among Nations. No hypothesis may be developed by a deduction, Schelling, or by induction, Clausewitz. So again, there's two ways you can do it. Clausewitz does it inductively, Schelling does it deductively. Just Schelling is basically a rational choice. He's applying rational choice a great deal of rationality, and also very much divided by economic thinking, using econ economic thinking to kind of give an argument. I think this is the thing in class, which is kind of looking through a deductive method, right? This is the, again, of this. Now let's turn to the next one. Theory number two, the theory testing hypothesis, or dissertation, dissertation, uh, um, uses empirical evidence to evaluate existing theory. So therefore, we're testing it. Uh, 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 this evidence takes the form of, le of large and analysis, case studies, or both, right? And he goes, for example, of this work on testing theories, including Bennett, nuclear black male, nuclear balance, right? Again, this is, his examples are mostly forming on terms of international security and international relations, right? So he goes, many dissertations are a blend of type one and type two. They do some theory proposing and some theory testing, right? Uh, 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 he goes, he, now he gives some examples, so I'm not going to go read them because, you know, uh, um, he goes into them and he's like, he says, he goes in, I think he has this one about Mersheimer's con uh, a conventional deterrence, 83. Note that such works often begin with a theory testing projects. The author begins by testing other theories and developing his own theories midstream. Uh, uh, this reflects the great, great difficulty of creating theories from, from uh, a standing start. I advise students not to try it. <laughs> Instead, test someone else's theory. Create a creative lightning may uh, 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 creative lightning may strike you when you're uh, at it, but it doesn't. Uh, it uh, but if it doesn't, you can still produce a good thesis, right? Again, this is his point. This I think this is a very good point. In other words, most works are kind of like in most kind of better people they first deconstruct, then they create a new thing, and then they do things. Theory generating is difficult. Most people, and most students, and this is what I would even say to students, it's sometimes better to, it's, 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 a, it's, it's better to, uh, for thesis works, like BA thesis and MA thesis, you don't have to be that original. You have to just merely do a good job. So take someone else's theory and then apply it into a new case, okay? Or, 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 in other words, test the theory, test the theory, T test the theory. This is usually a very good thing. That's why number two is like this. So if one that combinate, combines one and two, um, it's hard. Because, well, a lot of theses do this, but this is risky in that sense because often, often you, it, you, it's very difficult. So therefore, like most of these guys, they first deconstruct some, they attack someone else first. 
and then they create theirs, right? That's just the point. Um, however, a good thesis can focus elusively on theory proposing or on testing theory, as long as it contributes to useful knowledge. Again, this is the question. Contributes to useful knowledge in the field of study, right? That's the whole point. It must contribute to the field of knowledge. Does it give us more knowledge? Number three, literature assessing or stock taking, right? Dissertation. Literature assessing or stock. In other words, this is kind of an oversight, looking at a topic or a theme or an issue and looking at what um, basically it says, summarizes and evaluates existing theoretical and empirical literature on a subject. You're summarizing and evaluating. Others are giving comment on it. It's not just merely summarizing. It's you're judging it. You're making some judgments about its usefulness. See, this is a problem a lot of students don't understand. They think this is one of the issues of a literature review. They think a literature review is this mere summary of what the idea is. Many students actually do don't understand the difference between uh, 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 summarizing something, uh, you know, giving a summary of something, and evaluating it difference. Evaluating it, summarizing it is reporting, it's kind of reporting it. It's tertiary. This is tertiary. It is simply reporting what other people have said. Not adding your own thoughts. Evaluating is you, your evaluation of this. Now, some people engage in what we call their evaluations are not their own evaluations and they're reporting in other words they're reporting the field and then giving the the opinions of other people and this is the big problem and this is why you have to be careful here because that that is tertiary um, um, the only time you should in fact you, the, what students often will quote other people but use the quote as though this is their argument okay they report now now it would be okay to say this is my in other words this should using that kind of stuff should be evidence to say well other people have thought this as well and therefore this kind of gives credence to my my argument right it's it's you're using it as authority for your opinion your evaluation but it should not be used those those sources those authors and their opinions should not be used as substitute for your own position because otherwise this is not your work anymore it becomes it's a, therefore secondary remember the primary primaries data primary scholarship is primary literature is always the you know the data of the phenomena this is like the records the accounts the sources of things right the reports the data the uh, in other words this, this this is like this a secondary scholarship is analysis and tertiary is basically summarizing what others have said. Okay. Uh, a book review is is a combination of and should a good book review should not really just be a summary. It should be a, a interconnection between summary and evaluation. Hence, well, what, what a, 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 a stock literature is not just a book review. And this is the problem. That, this is something I, I I mean I want to talk. I mean I shouldn't go that deep here um and often uh, you know in a thesis or an article you're expected to address literature well you should address the whole literature this does not mean that it, therefore you know, I, I have this problem often in my career teaching students in the, over here in europe is that we ask them to do a literature review or a a kind of a, a stop you know assessing literature assessing pro, uh, 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 essay what ends up happening is you just get a series of book reviews or a series of reviews of articles. No, in other words, there's no often no real attempt to kind of get a big picture of the thing, divided up in thematic aspects, um, the themes of the topic or the area, uh, highlight the different views. Instead, you get this guy, this guy, this guy. And if there is kind of that kind of stuff, it happens simply by accident, not by intent. In other words, it just becomes like a series of, oh, this guy said this, this guy said that, that guy's, that woman said that, or that person said that. And it, and, and it becomes kind of like a, a series of book reviews or article reviews uh, or precises of articles in that sense. Rather, and, and nothing is really put together. 
a good literature review or this kind of thing is a thing that's put together, right? Um, uh, now, what does it do? He says it, uh, uh, it asks whether existing theories are valuable and existing tests are persuasive and complete, right? And he goes, he gives some examples of this, right? The, the, the question is whether they're valuable and whether they're complete. The net fourth uh, uh, type of thing is policy evaluative or policy prescriptive dissertations or theses in that sense. Now these evaluate current or future public policies or policy proposals, okay? This is policy evaluation, policy formulation. Are, are, in other words, and what they do is ask the question, are the factual or theoretical premises of the proponents and opponents of uh, uh, the uh, po proposed policy valid or invalid? It's a question, right? Are the factual and theoretical premises of the proponents or opponents of the proposed policy valid or invalid or the existing policy valid this is policy evaluation this is a very this is um a thing that's very much uh in public policy circles now if you're going to be doing a political theory i mean a, a, a political uh, domestic policy domestic you're looking at thing you're doing policy evaluation right you ask the question is what what are the premises of the policy Evaluate. Uh, this is evaluate. Not just see. A lot of people think I just by describing the phenomena I'm doing evaluation. No, you're not. What you're doing is describing the phenomena. You are doing this. Um, now you have to evaluate it. Uh, uh, eva a policy evaluating. It's not the policy reporting, but policy evaluation. And what you get here is therefore you need to ask: Are the premises, are the factual and theoretical premises of this proposal, of a policy proposal, in the present or future one, is it, are they valid? I mean, are the criticisms of them, are the, the claims, the, the, the premises of the criticisms valid uh, or invalid, fair or unfair? It is often said that policy prescriptive work is not theoretical. The opposite is true. All policy proposals rest on forecasts about the effects of policies, which is very much so. Um, uh, these forecasts rest in turn on implicit or explicit theoretical assumptions about the laws of social and political motion. Hence, all evaluation of public policy requires framing and evaluation of theory. Hence, it is fundamentally theoretical. And he goes uh, and he gives an example of this, right? The chapter six, uh, uh, and mostly again foreign policy, right? This is now he says policy prescriptive work can now this is different. This is policy evaluation. Now he turns policy pres prescriptive. I'm prescribing uh, policy. I'm giving a suggestion of what we should do. Um, policy prescriptive work can focus on evaluating a particular policy, on evaluating competitive solutions to a given policy or on the policy implications of a political or technical development, such as, for example, the nuclear revolution or the collapse of the Soviet empire, right? In other words, you look at the technical development and how this is gonna impact some of the things. And then you make evaluations, you make assessments and assertions about this based upon the, rea uh, the, the existing reality and the, pro the, the probability of events and things like this. And you make pre pre prescriptions and how to achieve this and how to avoid this, right? And this is very much occurring in security studies, international relations, but also in domestic policy, like healthcare policy or or uh, uh, social policy. These are all these strategies are are, are are present here in this regard. Now the fifth type of the seven, an historical explanation dissertation. It uses theory, academically recognized theory folk theory or common sense deductions, right? This is, this is a theory of either this, this, or this, right? To explain the causes and patterns of or consequences of historical cases. Mm -hmm. So, um, and very much, this is very much what goes on in what we call in America, APD, American American Political Development, um, which um, uh, it, it was started in the late 90s, mid 90s, eight, late 80s and 90s. You had this uh, the famous work by Athena Scopo on on uh, the mothers and uh, 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 how do you call it? There's a book about the veterans, the Civil War veterans, and the widows and and, and the children. 
um, and the beginning of American social policy. There's a dissertation on the post. There's a book on a series of books about the post office. Uh, there's a good, very good book by Bissell called Yankee Leviathan, which did that with the question of how the war led to the creation of certain government policies, the creation of an existing more st state structure. In other words, this explains that this is using kind of um, um, a kind of a Charles Tillian slash approach of sociology with combination of history with politics and trying to understand exact historical analysis, trying to understand uh, uh, using modern theoretical models or sociological models to uh, uh, um, uh, 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 try to see if they work and are valid in the past, right? And to see if the same thing, uh, how, and they also maybe even develop theories from the past and understand contemporary models, right? That's the two-way stride of it. Using t existing theories to test to see if they, in other words, use the existing models of development and things like that and apply them in the past to see if they are valid or not, or you can use the things or from the past generate theories that you can try to say predict make predictive values things now right um, such work often provides a good deal of description but focuses on explaining what is described now seven uh, examples uh, of historical analysis work of Thompson's how Vietnam could happen an autopsy um, uh, uh, and it's uh, many other books like uh, uh, about this, and I think that's little um, Daniel Daniel Keegan's outbreak of the Peloponnesian War uh, uh, um, is actually outstanding on this. Uh, John Misham's about Little Heart on little, uh, the question of war. This is a, again, this is I think is a very good uh, 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 um, of, of things. Now, this I would argue this is a much more developed thing, both in terms of not only in our relations but also in. American politics and American institutions, and also for it's actually useful for comparative politics and comparative institutions. So I think this is a very it, 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 it's it's okay. Dissertations of type five and type six are rare and little admired in political science. Is a problem. This is he's right that it was in the eighties. 60s, 70s, and 80s, this was the case. But now it's more, more. This reflects a general bias in the field favoring the creation and testing of theories over the application of theory. However, this bias is misguided. If theories are never applied, then what are they for? Theories uh, have value only if they're eventually put to work to explain, assess, and prescribe, right? This is the point. Moreover, scholarships of type type five and type six lack a friendly home uh, in other disciplines, which leaves the, this work to political scientists. Right? There's in other words, in other words, um, uh, uh, five and six are again. Is, uh, oh, did I skip something? Okay, no, no, it's, I did something. Hold on, I did something bad. Um, I skipped something. Sorry, I skipped something. Oops, oops. Five is historical explanatory, historical value, value. So therefore, there's such work there is a description that focuses on explaining and, and, and describe, right? A six, historically evaluated uh, dissertations evaluate, evaluate the factual and the theoretical beliefs that guided official or unofficial policy actors and or evaluates the consequences of uh, the policies they pursued, right? This is uh, some, you know, he gives example of this, right? This is the things. Uh, uh, and I think there's some very good work in international relations here. Again, he, his international relation focus really drives this, right? And it, and this is why I repeat it, right? He says, dissertations of type five, the theoretic, uh, what we call historical evaluative uh, and theory, uh, no, sorry, historical explanatory, uh, explanation, and explanatory, explanatory, ex, uh, explanatory and historical evaluative are rare and little admired in political science. I think that's true. This is this is, and this reflects a bias in favor of, uh, of of creating and testing theories over the application of a theory. However, this bias is misguided, because if theories are never applied, right, then what are they for, right? Uh, theories have value only if they eventually put the work explaining this. Moreover, scholarship of type five lack a friendly home. And other disciplines, right? There's, in other words, they they're not welcome in other disciplines, which leaves this work to political scientists. Some historians are averse to explicit in, in explanations. 
instead of preferring to let the facts speak for themselves. Right? Very common thing with historians. I've noticed this. The older historians and these this don't really like making predictions. They don't think that you can. They're kind of well. That's this is they kind of engage in kind of well. Um, that kind of is that's everything. It's kind of a relativism. There is kind of a in historic scholarship. There is well, that's true for that, and that's what what that is discovered there. But we can't generalize and say that this is going to be true in those situations. They're very hesitant. They want to say that, and also they tend not to make explicit claims. They tend to make, as we said, vague. They have very you know they tend to just merely describe the events and the occur the things. And if there's implicit arguments, they're usually hidden in their deep. Right? This is what he said earlier in other places, and I think he's right about that. And this is that they let the facts speak for themselves, which is problematic in a sense. Um, facts never. In fact, you know, and a good lawyer does not simply let the facts speak for himself. He he presents a, a, a good lawyer in a case never just let the, just puts the facts in front of the jury. You contextualize the facts. You present the facts. You can explain the background and why do you think that, and you kind of present an argument that says why this fact should go this way. And then also address the counter, you know, and, and, and kind of prevent, you know, address the criticisms of this view with counter evidence, right? Classic thing. Others will elaborate a preferred explanation. Others will elaborate a preferred explanation, but they rarely set contending explanations against one another. And as one must fully evaluate an explanation. So therefore, this is why this is good in that sense. Others' uh, approaches will elaborate a, a preferred explanation, but they rarely set contending explanations against each other. And one must fully evaluate an, an explanation. Historians are also, with some exceptions, right? There's, you know, he's, he talks about, you know, Paul Kennedy, or, uh, uh, Gerhard Ritter, and Paul Schroeder, right? He says, you know, night out, night day, right? Um, uh, generally averse to writing evaluative history. However, without evaluate explanatory historical, in other words, without explanatory historical works, um, works, uh, expert historical works, history is never fully explained. And without evaluative historical works, we learn little from the past about the present and future problem solving. Hence, some fields should accept these tasks. I nominate political science. Right? Just, in other words, he says, this is, again, this is, the, this is the argument. I think political science has been doing this. I think this has been the, uh, one of the big growth industries in political science has been this, this, the, the use of historical models. We saw this compared to politics. Um, why not you know, take the developmental models and do it? Now, we can see this in a little bit. Not so much Huntington, but let's say with Fukuyama is in his last work about state, taking Huntington and kind of going beyond to the past to explain this, right? His last two books. Huntington's classic work, um, um, Political Orders and Changing Society for 1968. Um, uh, Fukuyama in his last two volumes uh, about a decade ago, you know, um, um, you know what is the title? I, I, oh, it's, uh, it's, it's hiding over here. Or I know it's over here. Yeah, it's over here directly. Um, um, yeah, it's 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 political order. The thing about liberal political order and change, you know, and then the two volumes again from the uh, uh, beginning of history to the French Revolution and then French Revolution and now, right? This has been kind of like the, his approach. So uh, a next kind. Predictive. Seven, predictive. A predictive dissertation applies theories to ex extrapolate the future world from current events or from positive future development. Now, uh, he gives Jervis's The World of Future with Path. But also this is forecasting. You know, this is someone like um, uh, Friedman, um, uh, George Friedman's work, forecasting, right? This is kind of predictive, right? This is like for, forecast. Predictive dissertations are kind of like for, is pro, aspect of forecasting. Um, something in uh, something like George Friedman's work on the next fifty years, next hundred years, uh, um, and, and things like that. And 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 do you see this aspects of this right? Uh, and that's in geopolitics and geo things. But this is predictive in that sense. Policy predictive, right? Um, it possibly future developments. A purely predictive dissertation is a risky project because the future is constantly happening. 
risking the danger that the project may be overtaken by events, right? It changes, like, yeah, I remember this. This was a lot in, um, I remember in the 2004 is about predictive about American economic policy regarding tax reform and things like this. And people making certain predictions about the policies of the Bush administration, the W. George Bush's Bush administration, about welfare reform and things like this. But then events happen and this undermined things, right? And then you know the way Katrina happened and the collapse of this and the you know you know and then the uh, uh, the savings and loan crisis. Um, um, there's been, they were there they have been good analysis both in economics predicting like you know some people predicted the chaos the events of this um but uh, i think uh, uh, in economics there are some people who got things right in that and then some people who got the things very wrong uh, so therefore this is why it's risky right uh because you're taking overtake therefore students should generally steer clear of this of the sort because it's too risky too like this However, this warning isn't ironclad. Predictive work can be valuable and can take a dissertation form. So you shouldn't do it. It's risky. It's, you, can, you end up becoming this. And what happens is if things event, you push totally wrong, go in a different direction, you, in which you, it, it becomes a, it, a wonderful idea, but it can lose its value. Yeah. Only, you know, it's, it's like hitting the lottery. You know, this is kind of lottery get bet. This is like a lottery ticket kind of thing. Predictive dissection is a lottery ticket. If you get lucky, in a sense, if your analysis, in other words, if the event something doesn't happen and change doesn't change, and that your value, your prediction proves to be correct, take a, a, a fulfilled out of this, then you become a rock star in a certain degree, right? You become a kind of a rock star. And this is, this is in some ways happened to Fukuyama, and remember his piece. His so-called end of history piece uh, it was a, it was a basically presentation in 87, 88 at a Olin Foundation talk that uh, the the uh, uh, the center the Olin Center uh, funded center at University of Chicago had a Alan Bloom Bloom and had many of his former students or people who were kind of signed to his former students who are now doctors working at you know policy things interested in Hegel and things like that to talk about the, you know, the current situation. This is, Bloom was kind of always doing this, right? And Fukuyama's piece was talking about, you know, okay, the, the general trend. And this is, this echoes uh, what he was talking about was the general trend that was happening in the 1980s anyways, uh, particularly in Latin America and Asia. We see this in um, um, Huntington's book, Third Wave, which is, which is, you know, produces about the 90s, but mid 90s, the lecture series, uh, of this, but it was with him just adding the Eastern European data and information upon the third wave of democratization, right? This idea of the third wave is the waves of democratization, and that this was kind of something that was going on of this, and that, um, and therefore, in many ways, this is why I say Fukuyama and Huntington were more in agreement. And that you can even see that in the later work, then then everyone in the nineteen early thousands, uh, uh, mid nineteen nineties and early thousands, which produced in, in particularly in Europe endless Fukuyama, Fukuyama, Fukuyama kind of arguments because of end of history uh, uh, in the so called end of history thesis versus uh, uh, class of civilization. Right? That was the kind of oh my god, there's two different things here. Um, no, Huntington. Fukuyama got kind of right for a while, uh, particularly the events of the Cold War, ending of the Cold War. Now, he was basically just reporting the general trend of, of, of the democratization that was occurring both in Latin America and in uh, trends of, you know, what we call neo classical liberal, neoliberal democratization that was happening in Latin America, Central and Latin America, and in East, uh, uh, in East Asia, the Tigers. Um, and by the mid-90s, this was very, you know, this was clear. But, you know, when he wrote this, it was more clear because of the, what happened in the Soviet Union. And the Soviet Union, you know, the article coming out in the, 
uh, uh, the issue because uh, he was doing, what he doing. He was he was taking these events and trying to add Hegel's idea of this to this. Right, that's the Hegel's idea of the end of history. Right, and understanding this idea of Hegel's understanding of their history, he made the claim that this is gonna you know this we've come to an ideological the ideological conflict of the, the current time that of communism and and capitalism has come to an end and there's no real competing ideology. And therefore, this was the end of history in this sense, right? Um, this failed to understand that there were still competing ideologies. Islam, in other words, there was an, uh, in other words, there was a reaction against. Uh, there's always a, like an issue, an aspect. In other words, this neoliberal policy that defeated communism lent to a reaction against it, right? Uh, which manifests itself either just simply just localism, relig either religious, cultural, or political reactions against this, right? That's, and it, there was no real one ideology in that sense, except the religious Islamic sized one ideology that came out there and that became shaped. The, 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 uh, it was a rebel, uh, the, the Islamic terrorism became an ideology, emerged as an ideology aimed against Western globalism. And then the same thing happened, you can argue with Russia, with Eurasianism, right? This is came. This was there was always a ideal. There was always a gem there, but what happens in, in reaction to this neoliberal model? This the, is radical Islam, and um, uh, 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 and then Eurasian, um, and then he, the other word is Chinese. The Chinese Communist Party ch abandoned communism, but embraced this uh, F, uh, Hun nationalism. Uh, with the party state as still, in other words, even though the, the, the party state no longer meant uh, communism, it meant uh, uh, Hun nationalism, okay, um, and a Hun supremacy, okay, so therefore you have an understanding. This is, so Fukuyama got, became a superstar because he was right. Now then what happens? Well, it went too far. He backed away from his position, right? Because, you know, he said, oh, no, 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 I didn't really mean that. You know, people, his proponents read him to mean far more than he actually wanted to mean. This is why his, you know, again, this is a theory. Predictive distortions are very difficult to do. It's like hitting the lottery. And if you get it right, you become a superstar. You become, you become famous. And it's mostly not because you've done anything wonderful. It's that you got lucky. Uh, in a sense, you got lucky. You sent. You you had an idea. You, you could do. Everyone could do predictive theses. This is not done. But the problem is that it hits. That it, it, it um, a lot of times things change. The background situations, the conditions of events, the the, the conditions that you assumed were going to happen simply no uh, weren't there, and therefore the the assumptions your the, your uh, your analysis or prediction was based on certain things happening that didn't happen and therefore you and then, then the other thing is that uh, what if you don't if you have more mo if you have a more friendly model to that that, that avoids those kind of specific detail problems in other words remember remember very unique and very certain right this is the danger so therefore it's going to be very difficult to get a very unique theory of a of, of predictive dissertation right if you, uh, the more certain and unique you, your thing is going, the more unique your claim is, the more likely historic situational imp impact or events can throw your, uh, the, 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 the assumptions you had in your, the, your uh, 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 argument or your thesis uh, out the window. And that's what he says now. So, okay, that's enough talking. I've been blobbing for a while. Let's go over here now. These seven types of dissertation can be uh, uh, summarized into four categories, right? Theory proposing, which is the first type. Theory testing, type two. Theory applying, which is type four, but also historic, uh, uh, um, histor too historic, the historic e, um, explanation, historic evaluative, right? And seven, which is, again, predictive test, right? This is a kind of predictive test. And then last, literature assessing, which is three, right? Dissertations of type one and type two, theory making and theory testing, have the most cachet in political science. But all seven are legitimate if they're well done. Be clear in your own mind which type of thing, research project or things you're doing, right? If 
finally, some words on descriptive dissertation. Now, this is the, the last thing. Descriptive dissertations are, are, are in order. In other words, descriptive dissertations are in order. Such dissertations describe political circumstances. Now, let me. Description establishes data points. It, explanation explains the structure of data. So description establishes data points. Explanation explains the structure uh, of data that has already been described. The following statement illustrates the difference. On January 19, 1991, oil sold for $40 per barrel on the world market. Pure description. And in late 1990s, the Persian Gulf crisis caused consumer fear that war might disrupt oil uh, uh, supplies, which caused panic oil buying, which pushed up the oil prices from under 20 to $40. Description and explanation. The price of oil is described and explained. Right? That's, so therefore, uh, uh, um, some things describe, but it's, you don't want to merely describe, you want to describe and explain. Mere description is as mere facts, right? Uh, they come in two types. Contemporary descriptive, focusing on current developments and conditions. Examples of contemporary works, such as the 1980s, describing conventional military balance in Central Europe, you know, in Mersheimer, right? These, um, now, he says that descriptions of these events, and he's focused on international relations, right? And security studies. Pure descriptive, right? Contemporary descriptive, focus on current development and conditions. And historical development, focusing on the past events and conditions. Um, example of this works by political scientists are largely historical. De uh, a descriptive includes uh, France Kaplan's The Wizards of Armageddon, uh, about nuclear uh, things like nuclear war and nuclear tendency, American strategy of this. And he goes, these works all provide some explanations and several do some theory testing, but their focus is mostly descriptive, right? Now, A descriptive a dissertation is an eight possible type of political science dissertation. However, a purely descriptive thesis will be poorly received by other political scientists. They want the authors to explain or evaluate the events, policies, or ideas that they describe. So not just describe it. You, must, you need to explain, evaluate, or evaluate the events, policies, and so on, right? Combination. This is... Political science, mere description is not enough. Now, the, the only thing about this is that you're describing things that were never known before. Okay, Hence, description should combine some, make, uh, 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 some making, testing, or explanation of a theory. Descriptions often precede explanations or evaluations. However, since phenomena that have not been described cannot be explained or evaluated, right? So if you, in other words, phenomena that have not been described cannot be this. Um, hence, students who seek to explain or evaluate phenomena that others have not fully described must first devote heavy attention to description, given largely to largely descriptive dissertations. This is fine as long as a student does, uh, 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 also does some explaining and evaluation, right? In other words, you're looking at this and then giving the example of Lieberman, right? Good dissertation of this kind is Lieberman's at Conquest Pay, uh, uh, MIT dissertation, right? I remember it was his, right? And later uh, uh, later published as Con does Conquest Pay, right? Um, uh, in 1996, Lieberman devotes substantial space to description because previous scholarship left the phenomena he explains, the benefits of empire law described. He then develops and tests explanations for the patterns he described. So you can do a descriptive thesis. Now there is the argument, you but it, uh, it, things that have not been described. But there's another problem. This is why we have to be careful because cultural anthropology, political science versus let's say cultural cultural anthropology, of uh, something like Clifford Gertz. Clifford Gertz's famous work on uh, uh, Balinese cockfight with its thick description. Well, this is a description. He describes. He phenomenologically describes a thing. Because this is something completely alien. He's going through a thing. This is, this is an aspect of anthropology. Now, comparativists, particularly comparative politics, who were kind of running away from methodology, look to cultural anthropology methods to kind of define their work. 
But the danger of this was that by doing this, they ended up doing mostly a, a kind of descript heavily descriptive things that did not really ultimately. I mean, this is some of the, this is what problem with a lot of the Gert scholarship and that stuff was that it was interesting. It was interesting to read like this, but how can we test this? It's so unique. In other words, it's too unique. It has no applicability other situation. So how is this useful to our understanding? They're, okay, you're saying that this is unique? Okay. And this helps us understand that, but then uh, we, they, unless we adopt, the argument is, unless we adopt the, the minds of this, we have to only understand the thing in light of its own self-understanding. And there's no, there's no common shared re comparative reference. That, therefore, this kind of modeling denies the possibility of comparison. But even while they're doing it, they're comparing because they're using our language. They're using, he's, in other words, this is the irony of Gertz is the things that minute he is implicitly, the problem here is while he's describing things, the way he's describing things are often implicitly giving us a comparison to our own Western or individual experience of the author. So, and therefore there are therefore mechanisms common reference points and things that explain things in understanding and therefore there is a, and therefore there is a way to evaluate the problem with the comparative uh, the anthropological approach was the kind of fear of anthrop they were like his many was anthropologists were like foreign worlds and foreign people cultural and social anthropologists were kind of like looking at these peoples and looking at the same way historians looked at that they were kind of lieu of making general claims. So the criticisms that uh, uh, whenever it aims at historians also hold true to, I would argue, to kind of cultural anthropologists in a very much sense. And this is what explains this reality. And this is how it ends this. Um, and ends the different types of things. Now, I just want to go into this description types, right? He says, what, how do you write how, helpful hints of writing a dissertation? Well, um, uh, uh, is often make following suggestions to grad students who are launching dissertations, right? Topic selection. A good dissertation asks important questions, and answers should be relevant to real problems facing the real world. So, Morgan, Hans Morgenthau once lamented that social scientists often hide in the trivial, the formal, the methodological, and purely theoretical, and the remotely historical. In short, the politically irrelevant. And this is from his piece of, uh, you know, Purpose of Political Science. Such conduct is both a crime and a blunder. Being irrelevant is more fun, better for the world, and a, and a good career move. Scholars who would advance bold arguments win more praise and abu than abuse if their work is sound. Research gains visibility largely by having college teachers assign it, right? Teachers uh, assign work that frames debates, hence work that boldly presents a side to an important debate or starts its own, uh, own debate will be more widely assigned and thus more renowned. Its author will break, uh, will bask in academic fame and glory, right? <laughs> it's like, so therefore, you know, again, this is why he says this is again. So don't, you know, don't pick important top questions and relevant ones, right? Again, go look at the, what makes a good theory. What makes a good theory also makes a good argument. What makes a good argument also makes a good research dissertation, right? The thing you're gonna write on, an article, thing like this. Um, how can good topics be found? Starting yesterday, keep a book, a, a book of articles that someone should write file, right? What things, what, what needs to be written? What needs to be done? When uh, when you form a mental picture of something that you want to read, but uh, a search reveals that it doesn't exist, record a hypothetical title and says dash it in your books and article files and things that you want to do. The title and article. This is a very strange way of doing it, but I understand this is many of these absent articles won't be situated suitable projects for you, but some will. The rest are possible topics for your friends and future students. Uh, you do a major service by devising projects that they can execute. There's a connection. I mean, I, I understood this. Uh, you know, I think Bloom, Strauss and Bloom often, now Strauss did produce a lot, 
Bloom and Cliff Orwin and many of the Strauss students don't, I mean, many of them, they have some books. Bloom's record of producing books was kind of mediocre compared to, uh, or even scholarship, as he had some, but usually they were kind of, but he was good at producing students and good ideas for students. That students themselves were able to produce work and produce great scholarship from. And I think that was also true of someone like Cliff, uh, Cliff Orrin to a great degree too. Um, and that's also true of many uh, dissertations. Now, some people are prolific, but they're also good at uh, other things. Now, some people are not prolific, who are very good at making other, giving other people ideas to work with. And I think this is a good idea. He said that you, come up, you, you should always come up with ideas and teach like this. And that you can, this, either for friends, people you know who's interested in that thing, you might not be able to do it. You might have the skills or tools to do what this thing does. But you may know some, I mean, I have the same thing. I, I, I mean, I would say, listen, one of the most important areas in political thought that needs to be developed is Grotius and Pufendorf in this period of, at this point. Uh, it's there, some people doing it. Bodin, Bodin is one of those areas that needs to be doing it. People saying, well, why don't you go write something about Bodin? It's because my, my, my French is mediocre, honestly. Uh, 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 people, uh, 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 16th century, 17th century, uh, 16th century French, 16th century French is rough. It's tougher than normal French. Um, um, and Latin, my Latin is bad. My Latin is better. My Greek is better. My ancient Greek and my uh, 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 Greek is better, and my French is better than my Latin. But um, uh, my Latin is bad. I can struggle with it, and I do struggle with it when I have to. Uh, I didn't really study it. I, I, I had to kind of force myself to learn. I, I studied Greek because of you know Bible, right? That's why I uh, be growing up a Baptist fundamentalist Bible, right? Um, um, and therefore that kind of does a, a, a things that you're not going to write and it can do it, right? After, after each graduate school class, write an audit memo about the subject area of the course asking what was missing, right? What was missing in the class? What important questions went unasked? What answered answers did you expect to find in the literature but they never appeared? What research projects could provide these answers? So therefore, first, um, uh, what was missing, what questions, or what answers you expected to find in literature but never showed up, and how would you, what, what, how would you, how could you find that right, research project? How could you answer these questions, right? PhD qualifying exams offer another opportunity. To, now this, okay, in America, the PhD qualifying exams are a set of exams you take, which before you're allowed to start your dissertation, you have to uh, uh, pass. Okay. Usually it's field questions, your major field and your secondary and tertiary field. Okay. Sometimes some programs only primary and secondary. Um, you have to answer is a test and it's, 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 you'll give you, you know, usually sometimes per primary field, you have to write four questions and then secondary field, two questions. These are usually lists of readings you have to read and not questions or things you have to address. You do usually there's every field will have re, uh, re, reading list requirement expectations, and that the questions often will reflect uh, 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 issues and themes that the, the field, and the, or at least the field at your school, holds to be important in that sense. Well, these are the kind of qualifying exam in the typical American program. Um, um, uh, most programs have a leaving. They have two. Um, uh, uh, if you're an MA program, the, the, the MA qualifying, usually you have MA exams. Usually the MA exams are more, I mean, usually they've gotten rid of it. Pure MA programs got rid of the MA exams. Uh, most schools have, doctoral programs have two sets of exams. They have the qualifying exams. So usually people who, America, most people start in the DHC program from the beginning. So what happens is um, um, uh, you, 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 if you come with a master's degree, then the, the expectation is that you had some kind of formal exam and program. And your program gave exams, they would have recommended it. That's why if most BMA programs that had a thesis or had a thing like this that had exams or even some most things had it exams. If, you, if your MA program didn't have a 
a, a, what we call a, a, a comprehensive exam at the end for the uh, program. I suspect doctor programs are not going to want you. They're, they're going to make you sit at the beginning and not accept your MA status. Um, um, but I don't know what the new rule is. In the 1990s, it was you had to have done that. I went from a master's program to a doctoral program, and I was exempted from the MA uh, qualifying exams. But then at the after my, at my I finished my coursework at the doctoral, then there was the comprehensive exams. Because uh, usually if you're starting an MA work, you're starting in a, a doctoral program right away, you start out with an undergraduate right away into a doctoral program, your first year is uh, that, and then at the end of the first or second year, you take a qualifying exam. The, with the qualifying passing of the qualifying exam, um, two things happen. Well, how well you pass will indicate whether they want you to continue. Um, if you don't, they if you pass but not so well, they might just simply not move you. They might simply just say sorry. Um, you, and we're giving you the booby prize. We're giving you a master's degree. Bye bye. Uh, we're not continuing you. We're not continuing on your doctor program, and that you get you get a master's prize as the booby prize leaving the program. Um, and often a lot of people think this is what happens to students who go to a doctoral program uh, 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 and leave only with a master's degree. Um, uh, one of the problems I, uh, I faced, well, I, I, didn't, I was not accepted in the Dallas program for many reasons, also because the, the expectation was that there was a, I, I think it was my GRE scores were kind of bad because my dyslexia hurt me on the GRE test. Um, and uh, my scores weren't high enough to get admitted into a, a the pro program, um, I, 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 um, I, when I went, um, I, I got accepted into the master's program. Okay, I was thinking, but they didn't want me. The, the Dallas didn't want me because um, I think it was more that I was not Catholic, but also because of the, uh, uh, conflicts with people like Tom West and things like that um, didn't really want me to be there, and that people I was attracted to. I, I mean, I. If I was an English major, I probably would have been accepted, but I was not an English major. I was a political scientist. Um, so um, uh, people say, why don't you become a philosopher? I knew one guy who became a philosopher because the philosopher's department was desperate for students sometimes. But I wasn't interested in becoming a philosopher. I was interested in political theory. And, and uh, that's why I left, uh, you know, and then went, uh, uh, took a year off and worked in the corporate world and then went back to, uh, then got applied again and did better in the NGREs. But not much better, but better, yes, much better. Um, um, then what happened was, wah, wah, I got into a program. Um, but uh, 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 the school that offered money was the one that you know I went to. Um, and th there was the reality of the co comprehensive exams, right? This is... How you do this. this is the way you do this comprehensive exams so you enter in a program you do the program you get into the thing you get comprehensive you have your qualifying exams and therefore this is the point he says this is qualifying exams offer opportunity to audit the field of flexible holes you have surveyed the fields new uh, fields horizon now write a memo on the questions and answers that turned up missing in the literature and the research that provide that, that, that could provide the missing answers right again these are things Dissertation topics also can be found in policy debates. First, read up on the policy debates you care about, and then identify the key disputes of facts and theories that drive the opposing side to their opposing to opposing conclusions. Then devise a research project that addresses one or more of these disputes. Right, that's three. This is uh, uh, Child Glasses recommend this search method. Uh, this search method for research topics. That's a classic idea. The search method re locates research questions that are unresolved and germane to important public policy questions. Also useful on topics is Madsen's successful dissertations and St uh, Sternberg's how to complete and survive doctoral dissertations. Now, organization. Good dissertation has a, has a thesis, in other words, a main line of argument or a set of related arguments. Five, purely historical descriptive theses are exempt from this requirement, but their author should still identify and highlight any theme or structure that emerges in the material they present, right? So therefore, this is the idea that they should have. But it's still a good argument. A good, a good thesis and a good thing should have a main clear argument. Main clear argument. That's always important. I think that's true even in historical dissertations and even theoretical dissertations. If your dissertation lacks a theories, think it through again. 
If your dissertation has too many ideas, consider ways of organizing your ideas more simply. Very good idea. Organize, organize, organize. Uh, 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 don't have too many main ideas. One main idea. Simplicity. Keep it simple. simple. Kiss. K-I-S-S. Keep it simple. Um, the first prospect, your dissertation perspectives. This is your this is proposal, right? This is proposal. Like this. Your dissertation perspective supports your application for research money, usually, right? Your perspective sh should be uh, five to ten pages long, should f uh, frame the questions you will address, the, uh, uh, the reasons why these questions are worth exploring. So, therefore, what is the question you're going to question or questions you will address? The reasons, uh, a kind of argument why they're exploring. Your, what is your working hypothesis or the answers you expect to find, your method of inquiry, right, how you're doing it, and the reasons you chose your, these methods, okay, justification of why the methods you took, why these works, why this thing, right. Um, you should footnote or your prospectus as you would do a research paper. Good bibliographic footnotes to existing works on your topic are important. So, in other words, you could very good, do very much get your footnotes and your perspective, but then and have good bibliographies, uh, footnotes explaining why the research you're dealing with, right? Before sending it out, circulate to your prospectus among friends and colleagues for their comments and criticism, right? Um, now for your introductory chapter, right? Um, your introduction conclusions are the most read part of, the, uh, of most dissertation and are the only read part of many. Hence their merits, uh, uh, design merits special attention, right? You should start your dissertation with a summary introducing the chapter. The summary introduction sh helps reduce readers measure your evidence against your claims and the argument by clarifying these claims and the arguments at the outset. In other words, uh, 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 this makes your work more readable, right? Again, this is clearly state, you know, you know, you start by summary introducing your chapter. What are you doing? What are you going to be doing? Spell everything out. Summarize what your, uh, 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 summarize introduction, how readers measure your claim, evidence against your claims, and arguments by clarifying what the claims and the arguments are at the outset. Now, that makes it readable. Readability is important here. Your summary introduction should be answer six questions. One, what question or question do you address? Spell them out clearly. The dissertation that can propose theories, test theories, explain historical events, evaluate a policy, uh, 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 past to present policy, or policy proposals. It can summarize and assess body literature. It can describe contemporary circumstances or historical events. It can do several of these things. Clearly state which of these missions you're going to, your work is going to fulfill, your dissertation to fulfill. Frame your question in terms that call for specific answers. So frame your, that you, you're going to be specific. Questions that began, how can we understand? How can we understand the meaning of nuclear war? How can we understand the process by which national rights are so open-ended that uh, vacuous non-responses, uh, uh, we can understand the meaning of nuclear war by reading time Bob Jobbers, technically qualifies as an answer. Focus questions are better. So not general questions. In other words, how can we understand? That's a, and I think this is the problem of political theory a lot of times, right? We get too general, too vague, and that this kind of general answers are satisfied, can work for this. Um, focus questions. What are the consequences of nuclear revolution? What are the consequences, uh, causes of nationalism? Questions that require cause or consequence, or uh, 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 that poses specific descriptive tasks. How numerous were Stalin's victims are better, since readers can more easily tell if you answer them, right? So if you can, the question needs to be shown that you show that you can meet the answer, that you can know that the answer is an answer, right? That's right. Two, why do uh, these questions arise? From what scholarly literature or real world events, okay? Why do these questions arise? From what literature, scholarly literature and what world events? What previous literature had been written on this, these questions? What is the state of the art on the subject? If your questions arise from the evolving scholarly literature, you should discuss that literature in the text of your introduction and note ancillary or related literature in footnotes. Uh, note any controversies in this literature, explain their origins and evolution, detail the arguments made, both, uh, made, made by both sides and summarize their current status. Note the factual or theoretical crux of any continuing disagreement 
Note also the holes that current in the current literature. What um, uh, 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 what um, questions you have not been explored? Let uh, uh, let's ho uh, let's hope yours is among them. Right? What what questions has not been explored? And let's hope yours is among them. Um, uh, uh, you might interpret the motives that sustain continuing controversies. Right? What are the, what are the why are the what are the motives of this? Uh, what, if any, political or methodological motives are driving the current, uh, uh, driving disputants apart, right? Are the disputants honest scholars or paid polemics? In short, explain what's been going on in your field you are entering, right? If your questions arise from historical contemporary events, detail these events, explain the significance, explain why they give rise to the questions of the f questions you address. Also mention existing literature on the subject you address and note holes in the literature. Now, Regarding sequence, a graceful written first chapter can start with your questions on the, their historical factual content. It can work better to first frame the facts than, that steer your question, then frame the question these facts inspire, right? So first frame your questions and uh, facts, uh, steer your questions, and then frame the questions that these facts inspire, right? Um, three. What answers or answers can you offer? Clearly summarize your conclusions in your introduction. What is your findings, right? Your summary should often offer enough detail to let readers grasp the main elements of your argument by reading your introduction alone. It should run several pages at least. The opposite strategy of seducing readers by withholding in conclusions until late in the document merely tries readers' patience. Moreover, your argument is lost on many readers who won't read past your introduction. <laughs> That's why you should go deep. Four, what competing explanations, arguments, interpretations, or frameworks will your you reject or refute? Graceful chapter construction may uh, uh, be served by addressing this question and uh, question two at the same time. I wish my wife didn't bring well, all these drinks down because um, because what happened now is that they're getting warm. Oh. Clearly identifying books and articles, again, um, and ideas you, that you demolish, right? Clearly identify the books and articles. C connect your dissertation to all the debates in literature it speaks to. And if it speaks to several debates or, or literature, flag this so participants in each debate will realize that your work matters to them. This helps them and help also you. They will cite you and make you famous, right? make, improve your reputation, right? Five, how will you reach your answers? Say a few words about your methodology and sources. If you're going to do case studies, explain how you selected your cases. If you're going to do archival research, say so and identify the archives and sources you use. If you're doing interviews, offer some remarks uh, in your interview subjects and procedures. If you're doing la a large end statistical study, explain the origins and construction of the database you're using and explain your methods and, of analysis in terms uh, uh, in term comprehensible to many uh, uh, among your readers who have forgotten their statistics. If you're using other evidence, for example, press accounts, explain its, their, its nature. If your approach is logic deductive, explain this. If there are methods or sources that readers might expect you to use, but that for some reason you don't use, you might note this and explain your decisions. Evidence that proved to be unavailable and, and, and lines of research that proved unfeasible might be mentioned. If uh, they are important questions that you did not answer, identify these and explain why you could not answer them. Instead of writing your, your way around gaps in your research, explain them honestly in your introduction. But do your research in a way that doesn't require lame excuses, right? Number six, what comes next? Provide a roadmap to the rest of the dissertation. Chapter one explains uh, how I began my life in crime. Chapter two des de details early arrests. Chapter three describes my road to death row. Chapter six offers some theoretical conclusions and policy implications. Something of this sort. Joking. Really... Subject one. What, uh, uh, what is your question? Subjects. Subject one. What is your question? Two. Why does it 
uh, dissertation? Or why does this decision arise? And three, what is your answer are the most important ones. Make sure you cover these with care. Summary introductions of this sort reduce confusion about what your dissertation does and does not say. They, it, they also serve as a diagnostic purpose for the author. They act as a drafting summary to alert you to your internal contradictions and other floors of the structure of your argument. This helps you flag problems that need fixing. The introduction should be the first chapter of your draft and the last chapter you finish. Right? Again, this is again this is right. This is the first chapter of your draft, uh, but at the same time, the last chapter you finish. Since it summarizes your dissertation, you can't complete it until the other chapters are done and you know what they say. Don't spend efforts polishing it until the rest of your dissertation is written. So draft it and then do it. And then what happens is if you then discover that you had to change it, then you have to go back and change this. Your concluding chapter. Your conclusion should be, uh, 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 in your conclusion, you may want to summarize your questions and answers. And if your summary introductions, are, uh, if your summary introduction, particularly if, you're, uh, if your summary introduction curious. However, I recommend that you re re recapitulate your research only briefly and then explore its implications for greater length. What policy implications follow from your dis discoveries? Which general theories does it call into question? And which does it reinforce? What broader historical questions does it raise or settle? What further research is called for by your discoveries? This is the place to discuss the larger significance of your research. Again, the larger significance of your research in that sense. Study design and pre presentation. Observe cumulative knowledge norms. Political science is often criticized because few questions are ever settled and the same issues are revised over and over. Things will improve if social scientists follow practices that foster the accumulation of knowledge. So please follow these injunctions. One, have a research design before you start your research. This platitude is too often honored in the breach. The main purpose of research design is to help you avoid the situation in which uh, uh, the evidence does not admit the final uh, research questions, right? Uh, in other words, this is exactly, this is the thing. This is a reason to help you avoid the problem that your evidence does not address the research initial question. Those who provide, uh, proceed without a research design risk being marooned on a mismatch between their questions and their evidence. Two, so clearly framed research design. Have a research design. It specifies what you're trying to do, the kind of uh, evidence, and to make sure you're, the questions you're doing in the evidence you have are connect. Two, frame arguments clearly. Knowledge accumulates only if your readers know what you have said. If your dissertation proposes, tests, or applies theories, the reader should be able to arrow diagram these theories. Uh, you know, this is our argument. Uh, uh, if your hypothesis cannot be reduced to R diagrams, then your writing and probably your thinking are too muddy. Think your project through again. This advice applies to explicitly theoretical work and policy prescriptive work. All policy prescriptive work rests on theories, and good prescriptive writing frames these theories clearly. If your dissertation is largely descriptive or historical, you, your main discovery should be clearly summarized at least once in the dissertation and probably at the outset. If your dissertation tests theories or explanations, clearly frame their predictions or observable implications before presenting evidence. Theories and explanations are tested by inferring predictions from the explanation and then asking if the predictions are confirmed or disconfirmed by the evidence. You should explicit, ex, 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 you should explicate this process for your readers, more clearly framing the predictions your evidence tests. Most offers admits this step, but that doesn't make it wise. <laughs> frame all predictions. Uh, uh, frame all predictions that flow from your theory, including those that are falsified by the evidence or prove untestable. Failed predictions should be identified and their failure con confessed. If some predictions are confirmed and others fail, say so and offer interpretations. This, uh, uh, thus, your overall format should be a frame your theory. Uh, uh, slash explanation, B, infer predictions from it, and C, perform tests, and D, offer interpretation. By defi B, definitive. Your dissertation should reflect a 
comprehensive survey of literature and the evidence relative to your subject. Your footnote should provide a comprehensive bibliography to the important literature relevant to your topic. This requires that you gain mastery of all subject aspect of your subject. This is the problem. This is the thing that all my Polish students and a lot of Polish people don't understand. Uh, and the Europeans don't, a lot of the Kazan Europeans don't do. You have to know your subject. You have to know everything about it. You have to know as much as you can, complete, master. You have to master it. You have to master. That's why a master's degree, you're a master. You master your knowledge. It's not that you have a little bit. Your, your field, your question or topic, you master it. You know it. So therefore, be definitive. You know what your thing is. Four, document all sources and statements of fact. Very much important. This is, and do, uh, document all sources and statements of fact. This requires a good personal system for storing and retrieving your evidence. One of my rules of thumb, when in doubt, make photocopies, right, or, you know, or PDFs, right? Uh, copy everything that you might use or cite in your dissertation. This e uh, ease data reversal in documents. Uh, this eases data re retrieval and document, uh, documentation of sources. And if you're going to photocopy, make sure you put the bibliographic reference on it. If you do that, if you need, even if you're going to put that in PDFs, okay, maybe what you need to do is you need to put a, a make sure on, uh, on the title the citation is done. Or a mechanism, a short, the title should give a, in other words, my, my, my thing about this, I always do this, I, I use author year title, right? And then I, once you have a bibliography, you can find author year title right to that, right? Uh, sometimes I add, uh, for private articles, I add um, uh, uh, um, author, year, journal, then title, right? That's that's the uh, and usually abbreviations of title, big titles. Sometimes not. Uh, that way you can find out what the exact full reference is. You know, you don't, you, sometimes you get some things, references on the uh, copy, the PDF copy. So if you copy, if you copy it, photocopying it, you write it down. Um, be careful. Um, these wonderful note programs fuck you in the end. What? Oh, be careful. Note programs. These, these note note taking programs. Most of them don't always give you page references and don't give you things properly. And often, sometimes they pull data. If you're pulling information from even Google Scholar, sometimes even in the format, format Google Scholar is giving it is not always correct. Sometimes Google Scholars, uh, the, the site, the, the site is for some reason there's an error in how the data was collected. You know, because who knows? Some uh, third world data entry person doesn't understand the source, and therefore they read something like, "Oh, University Sorting Service is a publication with a publication." No, this was this was just the host of the University Sorting Service was the host where the academic scholar posted his article from a journal or a book. So. This, you know, I've had this problem with students doing this, citing this out on their things, and I'm saying that's no, that's wrong. That's a bad site. You're wrong. So don't lose crutches because crutches will fuck you. You'll get a teacher will say, sorry, this is, oh, but it's not my fault. It's the computer did that. No, you used the damn thing, using it as a crutch, therefore it's your fault. That's why when you're using things like Zapparo or Note or something like this, you need to be very careful. You, uh, you should, uh, yes, it's easy to do that, take notes from it, it's great, but don't rely on, don't use that as a crutch. Don't use it as a substitute for knowing how to take proper notes. You should always know the major system you're using, APA, Chicago, uh, uh, um, uh, Chicago Scientific, APSA, MLA, uh, hot British Harvard, Fowler and Fowler, or, you know, whatever approaches you talk about, whatever source, you know it, you can know how to use it and how to cite it um, and, and be able to reference it from it. OK. And, you know, sometimes it's a pain in the ass. I don't like I don't like changing it. OK, that's what we're doing. Right? So, OK. Document everything. This, uh, uh, in other words, uh, court, in other words, uh, uh, five, I, I argue against yourself. Acknowledge counter arguments that might be raised by skeptical readers and briefly address them uh, later in the text. Concede what you should uh, concede what you should to these arguments and explain why you can't won't concede more. This shows readers that you have given due thought to possible objections and alternative interpretations. This also for, uh, uh, forestalls basis criticisms of your work. 
Okay, so argue against yourself. That's a very good point. Do plausible, uh, uh, do plausible probes at the first, in the first phase of your research. Do plausibility probes. Okay, is it, is it pl plausible or not? In other words, find out uh, the answers before you before doing their studies. The uh, experimental science uh, uh, model pr pr uh, proceeds from questions to hypothesis, to predictions, to experiments, to conclusion. This mechanistic pro uh, pro uh, pr program seldom works for us in the social sciences. Instead, we go from question to hypothesis, to prediction, to data exploration, plausibility probe, to revised hypothesis, to prediction, to later data exploration, to conclusion. In short, we often work backwards from answers to proof, right? Uh, of course, the deeper study refutes, uh, if deeper study refutes the re results of our plausibility probe, we report this. Some scholars go where evidence takes them, right? Scholars go where evidence takes them. This is the rule. Scholars should go where evidence takes them. Honest scholars, you know, but probably most scholars aren't honest anymore. Uh, we must do this uh, uh, to narrow the range of possible answers we fully investigate, right? So we have to range the possible answers, probabilities. In other words, we look at what's uh, plausible, what works, what can work, and therefore we reduce our things to what can we can do, right? Otherwise, we would waste time, uh, waste energy, uh, waste energy and time doing full dress of a uh, test of hypothesis that a curious look of data would re re refute, right? So we do things don't painful, you know, those don't 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 or, or don't are not important, right? Clearly said, identify works that your dissertation revises, contradicts, or supersedes. If your dissertation is theoretical or policy prescriptive, identify the names of the authors who you, your work refutes. If your dissertation is descriptive or historical, identify which previous accounts you're revising. This may annoy the uh, 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 superseded authors, but you other, otherwise your readers will continue to quote uh, will continue to quote out, out, outmoded, outmoded work, right? Uh, how can you sharpen your methodological skills? Reread works you admire. Keep an eye to, on how the author executed their projects. Form an, uh, an attitude. Uh, form an attitude on what they did right and wrong, and note the methods and sources they use. Consider whether similar methods or sources might be appropriate to your possible dissertation project or research project. Yeah. Now, writing. A well-written dissertation is more likely to be published and signed and quoted. So bear uh, the following points in mind. One, what a, what which, uh, that which is simple is also good. KISS, K-I-S-S. Keep it simple, silly. We keep it simple, stupid. Uh, um, if you're being, you know, the ruder way. Um, uh, key, uh, uh, that which is simple is also good. Your dissertation should make a single main point or a handful of related points. It should have a clear, simple structure. Avoid cluttering your dissertations with extra ornaments and gar uh, gargoyles, as often students do. In other words, in other words don't or or ornament. No extra or or ornamentations. Keep it simple. Avoid. Don't clutter. Don't add things you don't need. Just because you research something doesn't mean it belongs in the manuscript. Okay. Cutting is painful. I've spent hours over this. Too bad. In the world of research, half your work is done to be thrown away or saved for later projects. The logic of presentation varies from the logic of discovery. Exactly. This is the my always public. The lot the present you're presenting. Writing is about presentation. It's not about discovery. Research and writing are two different things. Research you, you discover, writing you present. Okay. Your research follows the logic of discovery, but your write-up should follow the logic of presentation. This means it should move simply and clearly from your questions to your answers. It seldom it is seldom wise to present your discoveries in the same order in which you made them. Yeah, it's common. Pitch your writing at the level appropriate to, uh, uh, for college under, undergraduate readers. Do not write at a level that only your faculty supervisor can understand. Scholarship that isn't used in the college classroom has little impact. Since you should take pains to address the average student. Two, the following structure is appropriate for dissertation uh, 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 chapters. A, your argument, your supporting evidence. B, three, C, counter argument, qualifications, and limiting conditions. D, brief concluding remarks, which may in, include comments on the implications of your argument or may note questions they rise. Okay, this is the following structure of dissertation chapters. 
This is the structure of a chapter. What is argument? Your argument, your supporting evidence, counter, uh, economy magnet qualifications, okay, admitting things, uh, and that. That's how your chapter should go, the structure. Um, start three, starting each chapter with several paragraphs summarizing arguments presented, from, uh, arguments presented in the chapter. You may cut these summaries from your final draft if they seem redundant to, with your summary introduction, but include them in your first draft. This will help your supervisor and friends to read the, and comment on individual chapters. You may also want to keep these summaries if they seem to fit. Finally, forcing yourself to summarize your argument in each chapter is a good way to make yourself confront contradictions or shortcomings in your argument. Often these chapter summaries are best written after you write the chapter, but don't forget to add them at some point. So summarization, beginning of your paper, start, start each chapter with a, par a, a several paragraphs summarizing the argument presented in the, uh, in the chapter you're talking about. Four, start each paragraph with the topic sentence that distills the point of the paragraph. Topic sentences appear uh, uh, as the second sentence in a paragraph, but should not appear later than that. So in other words, you know, uh, 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 you know, right away, start first or second. Right? Later sentences should offer supporting material that explains or elaborates the point of the topic sentence. Qualifications or refutations or counter argument should follow. Follow. In short, paragraphs should have the same structure as the whole chapter. Logic of this, right? Um, uh, 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 general uh, 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 topic, uh, uh, qualifications, refuting uh, to counter arguments, and then. Uh, 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 like this. So therefore, uh, 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 in other words, first your topic sentence, um, uh, the point of the pa paragraph, the, the uh, 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 sentences about evidence, material, uh, elaborating or explaining that, that, uh, that thing, and then qualifications to refute counter arguments, right? Qualification of counter arguments of the evidence, right? That should be a miniature of this. This, this paragraph structure should minister that. This should minister that. A reader should be able to grasp the thrust of your dissertation by reading only the first couple sentences of every paragraph. Five, break chapters into numbered sections and subsections. The more subsections, the better, uh, 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 more subsections are better than fewer. They help your readers follow your arguments. Label each sections or subsection with a vivid section heading that communicates the meaning of the section. So breaking up, dividing it, organizing. Six, write short declarative sentences. Avoid passive voice. Passive voice, the kulaks were murdered. But who did it? Uh, active voice, Stalin murdered the kulaks. Now he says, for more advice on writing, she shrunk in white, elements of style, or Teresa Pendleton's writings in international security, right? And number seven, if you are doing case studies, if this work, uh, um, if you're doing case studies, it often works to write detailed chronological histories of the case before doing the case study. This helps you gain mastery of the case. Then organize your material in. Then organize your material into the case study. Style. Acquire the manual of styles, citation method, bibliographic format, and so on. Recommended by your department or university before you start your research. Check the section on documentation bibliography. This ensures that you you, uh, you will c collect all appropriate citation information as you research uh, as you do your research. Otherwise, you may have to waste time later retracing your steps to recollect this required information. Three general style formats are common. Are common. University of Chicago format, which puts reference to sources and footnotes or end notes, or now as Chicago Scientific, right? The modern language of MLA format, which incorporates a reference parenthetically within the text, and the APA format, which puts parenthetical reference in text but varies uh, in other ways from the AMLA format, author year usually, right? Um, uh, the Chicago format is the most reader friendly, uh, the others clutter the text with references. In other words, this is the, the argument in the notes here. Yeah, this is, again, I like the other styles. I like this. In other words, it's the most user friendly because the reference on the bottom. Well, okay, I understand that. The Chicago style rules are detailed in K Turabian's Bible, a, a manual of writers, a, 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 a term paper, season dissertation. It's now in like a who knows God edition. Uh, Chicago University, Chicago Press. Okay. Slaveless, she obey your instructions. Style mistakes 
make your manuscripts look unprofessional, right? And this is what it's saying. In other words, that, that was style mistakes are reasons that you, I'm not going to look at. It's not going to. I'm not going to take you seriously as a scholar. Vetting when you finish your dissertation chapter, circulate them among several friends for comments and criticism. Don't be shy. The first law of scholarship is two headed is better than one. Vetting will improve your work. If you're, and that's what you need to, this, this is students don't do this. Yet. This is what I hate about Polish students and European, some of the European students, is that they don't like doing this thing. They expect the teacher to do it. No, no, you, sh you should be working with each other and doing things with each other, letting it, but they don't think telling each other. Everyone does, no, doesn't, doesn't. People, today's students don't want to tell the other ones the truth. They want to be liked. So therefore they allow, oh, it's great, it's great. Right. No, be honest, be critical towards each other. Um, if, it, if you don't understand what they're saying, you're not doing any help saying, oh, this is great. You know, this is, Again, this is, uh, uh, and then they, they, you know, one help person, oh, but then what happens if, you know, the other person doesn't help me? I waste my time. Like, again, this, you're in this, if you're a scholar, you're in this for this reason. If your chapters are really half break, the early dissertation chapters usually are quite terrible. So show some caution. It is pros, probably best not to show them to complete strangers who may conclude from them that you are brain dead and that you are uh, arrested. Should be turned off. Do not do, however, show them to friends who can be trusted to know that you're not brain dead, even though the condition of your chapter suggests otherwise, and who will help you kick them into shape. Conversely, then ask others to vet your work who should take the task seriously. Again, should take the task seriously. Helping others improve their written work is an important professional obligation. In carrying out this obligation, show mercy and compassion to your colleagues' work. In, uh, 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 if your colleague's work indicates early brain death, uh, while also making clear that there is significant room for improvement or offering specific feasible suggestions. Do not look slowly to your professors for vetting or criticism. Bible point. Yes, this is like this. Your friends should play an equal and perhaps even larger role. Graduate students sometimes view their fellow students as competitors to be kept at distance and left unhelped. This is a serious error for two reasons. First, it is not mensch like a mensch like not meant like a man, not a real man, not a mensch, mensch like. And I said Yiddishism, right? Not a mensch like. It's not a man. You should uh, uh, axiomat uh, uh, You should axiomatically, if your personal and professional life aspires to be a mensch. Okay, mensch, an upright, honorable, decent person, and someone who consequence, someone who can admire and emulate, someone who of noble character from the Yiddish, right? Uh, okay, uh, um, uh, or mensch is ungendered in this. Uh, <laughs> okay, um, um, the, be a mensch. And the world needs more menches, so be one. Your mother and I both hope that you will take this field. <laughs> okay. We will both be proud of you if you do. And mentions help their fellow students and colleagues. Second, aloofness from your fellow students is a career management blunder. The history of social science lies in the record of triumphs and discoveries by scholars who form empowering communities of mutual help and therefore perform their atomized colleagues. Exactly. This is social, the social dynamic of animals. This is the danger of this. And this is why, I, you know, and also being isolated and alone is sure to kill scholars. Um, and I knew that my experience, my whole experience has been kind of, as a young scholar, has been uh, kind of like, not that I sought to be alone, is that I, I, I because I didn't fit with them, <clears throat> I never found a place I fit. <clears throat> and even though you try, I tried being open to people. They just, mm -hmm. uh, uh, that explains a lot in a sense, right? You have to have networks of this. Those who act like pariahs often sink to the bottom. <clears throat> are those who help one another excel and prosper. Yes, Virginia, there is no conflict between collegial conduct and the imperatives of professional success. On the exact, uh, uh, on this exact matter, carefully uh, uh, study carefully Robert Axelrod's Evolution Corporation, which summarizes the key to success in academic life. Great, that's right. Um, <clears throat> At uh, your abstract, at the early stage, write out one or two page abstract that uh, provides clear, co cogent summary of dissertation. Circulate this abstract when you, you circulate draft chapters to help readers or ask the general director what you're doing. You should also include a provisional table of contents, which the chapter titles, which you circulate uh, a, a chapter. This helps you readers see the bigger picture, right? 
You might also include your prospectus when you circulate chapters to read unfamiliar projects so they can guess what you originally set out to do. Okay. Draft dealing with your dissertation committee. Okay. Okay. This is some, this is something I wish I had advice from. Right. Your advisor owes you a thoughtful reaction to your dissertation proposal and some reaction to your produced chapter. However, this uh, is your dissertation, not your advisor's. Your name goes on the cover. If you, if you are really stuck, as you will be from time to time, ask for help. But don't expect anyone to hold your hand through the whole process. Your advisor has the right to expect you to solve most of your own problems yourself and to seek your own solution before asking others to get involved. Your committee members owe you one, owe you one, but only one careful reading of your dissertation chapters. Do not expect iterated readings, uh, uh, multiple readings, you know, repeated readings. A loving advisor may give you more than one, but don't expect it. Hence, you should carefully choose when you want your committee members to read the drafts. Edit your chapters before showing them to your committee. <clears throat> It takes your committee far longer to read rough drafts, and they're less amiable to make useful comments. So neaten everything up before sending it around. If you want to, uh, if you want early mid-course corrections from your committee, ask your advisor to react to a detailed outline, not a half-baked draft. Listen carefully to your advisor's advice. Most of this advice will probably be wise. Some will be misguided. You needn't follow the errant advice, but, you, but, but do have reasons for spurning advice you have rejected. Do not make your advisor repeat things twice. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, remember that when you deal with your advisor, your professionalist is on display. Okay, this is the problem. Right? This is why you do repeat things twice. You know. Dealing with your head, your family, or your friends. Writing this station is a difficult, lonely act that requires a, a, a great will, a force of will. The best way to summon up the will is to choose a topic that fires you up, right? The consideration, uh, uh, th this consideration argues for choosing the topic that stirs your passion over topics that fill current field fashions, but let's take you less. The, ex the spouses, significant other, parents, and friends of, uh, of academics will often fail to grasp the central importance and great difficulties of writing a dissertation. They grow impatient with the many months of strange behavior, falling down manhold of absent-mindedness, vacant stare, the seemingly permanent hermit-like disappearance into a muddy library stacks, the vast cluttering of, of the apartment with clouds of car note cards and paper, mumbling to yourself when others can hear you, and so on. You must be strong against these enemies of knowledge. Forgive them of their ignorance and abuse, but do not concede to their entreaties to goof off on the weekend, go to the beach, have a beer, or otherwise act like a normal person. Those who have not written a dissertation can never understand how important it is to remain focused on the project. The best you can do is explain to them over and over that your career rides on writing a decent dissertation, and that writing a dissertation is like climbing Mount Everest. It can be done but only by careful pre preparation and intense focus on the task. If this doesn't work, take solace in the f fellowship of dissertation writing friends who are in the same fix and hope the divorce papers won't arrive before you get the degree. <laughs> and last, learn to uh, uh, learn how uh, 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 learn to learn more about how writing dissertations, right? We read several books that you like about use several approaches of, uh, similar to yours and imitate the better objects, right? And this is the thing that ends up. Well, I'm going to end it here. If you have any comments, I've done two, I've done more than chapter two. I've added this up there. I'm probably an hour over it now. So, mm. so if you have any questions or comments, please put them below. I hope this is useful. I'm ending this topic now on this, this thing here. Uh, um, We'll see what we do next. I have a couple more. I think I have a couple more episodes for this this the schedule that I have to fill out. So therefore, that's it. Have a good day. In that sense, uh, if you like it, like it. Okay, let's do. Let's. You can see me more this way. I'm gonna, we don't need to be here anymore. Dun 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 dun. If you like it, like it. Uh, 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 share it with a friend. Share it on social media. Get it out there. If you didn't like it. Okay, say don't like, but, but but say why so in the comments. If you have not subscribed, please subscribe. If you, um, why you get notifications of this and it helps build the channel like this. If you know your friends and friends who might be interested in what we do, get them to subscribe. I say this all the time, saying, "Well, why are you doing this all the time?" Because I have to do it every time because 
who knows, maybe someone can watch the video by this one time. Um, my links below, my social media links are below. If you want to follow me on my social media, uh, uh, they're below. Okay, uh, the, 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 they're mostly there. I'm I'm a little bit more active on Facebook because I I'm I'm, 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 a, I'm a gen first time you know core and Gen X or so you know I was like that. Uh, okay, I'm a little bit more in that. I'm on Twitter mostly for just to kind of post things and to maybe reply to somebody if someone does something post notice stuff that I've done on YouTube or something like this or my research. If I publish something, I want to get this out. Um, um, I'm on Gab a little bit, but not much anymore. I used to like Gab at the beginning when it was it was when, it, when everyone was fearing we were going to be banned from Facebook. Uh, uh, um, uh, but I, I've survived Facebook. My, my, uh, many people haven't survived. I, I, I somehow I somehow survived Facebook. Um, and my other social media links are there. Yeah, I also have my academic social media. Like, uh, link, I think maybe LinkedIn is in there. LinkedIn is both social media and academic. Um, uh, um, I, I use it mostly for academic things. I don't post much of why I'll post something in LinkedIn. But then I have my uh, Google Scholar link, which about who I am, about my research, but also that, uh, uh, research, uh, I think, or, or said also, I don't know if I put or said on there. I put my links, the ac social media uh, uh, links to who I am as a scholar, who I know about my scholarship and all of this. If you want to help me do what I do, and you can do so by a two, well, direct method is Patreon or Subscribestar. Become a supporter on by Patreon or Subscribestar. Um, this is one way. Uh, I'm, my channel isn't monetized. I haven't, I don't have, I haven't hit the status yet. So if you want to help me do this, you can do this. And that since I'm not making any money from YouTube in that sense, I'm too small. Um, and I'm not, I'm not willing to buy it. I, I mean, some people keep like, I get these, I, I, I'm, I get, I get these invites on, uh, uh, um, uh, on, um, how do you call? What is the uh, LinkedIn all the time from these Pakistani or Bangladeshi or Indian uh, 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 people on there saying, Hey, if you give us a couple hundred dollars, we'll help you get monetization. Okay, I don't buy that. I think this is what they do is they, this is bot making. This is bot farms and everything. You know, I'm very suspicious about this. Yeah. I, okay, but that's you're being racist. No, I'm just being commonsensical. Trust me. Um, you don't trust. You shouldn't trust those kind of people. Uh, if you, anything promising money for this is kind of like you're buying it. And you, um, but I, I have a wife who's a marketer, so I know this. I mean, my wife gets mad at me. You're not marketing it correctly. Okay, I understand this. My wife's, you know, background. She's an engineer and a market has market experience. Uh, she's an engineer and also marketing. It's so strange. Um, so, um, while well, that's it. So, if you want to help me do what I do? You can do so through Patreon, subscribe star, or you can send money through PayPal, PayPal, or something like that. Okay, you just use my address, right? You know, you can find my email address. You know. Oh, oh. You know, my name at, you know, my first name, last name at Gmail, right? That's how you do it. Um, but um, another way you can do it is buy one of my books that I listed below, my three books that I listed below. If you buy the Lulu book, buy the Lulu book uh, uh, through, better do it by, oh, you can buy, all these All these books are available at Barnes & Noble, Amazon. But if you're going to buy the Lulu book, buy it by Lulu because by doing that, you know, I get the money that Amazon gets. So it's a little better. Okay, that's it. Well, we're finished here. Um, I'm going to be doing something else now for there. Uh, one of the things I should be doing soon and is going through this. I think that the next project is uh, 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 at least one of the things <clears throat> that in a Schmidt thing. I think another Schmidt thing. I haven't decided yet. I I'm being very lazy. I should get off and do my uh, poll on this. What Schmidt should I do next? Uh, either dictatorship or uh, constitutionalism. Constitution up there. Um, so we'll see. Okay, on that, we'll take care and have a good day. Bye bye.